Hello everyone and welcome to our inspirational hour live from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm Ilana Gershlevitz, director of an ABA company in South Africa, author of Saving My Sons, A Journey with Autism and podcast host for Autism Now What? I'm also the mother of three boys. Two of my boys were diagnosed with autism. My older son, David, is 20 years old, and he's an adult with autism. My middle son, Ellie, who is a, a university student in first-year medicine at the University of Cape Town, is going to share his experience and thoughts on autism. My younger son, Aaron, who was also diagnosed with autism at a young age, lost his diagnosis of autism and we will be sharing his recovery story. I am delighted to let you know that I am also joined by my husband, Martin, over here, who will reflect on our journey with autism from a dad's perspective. By the way, we did not know what we were going to wear today, and we just happened to dress in black for the occasion. Um, so we're very excited um, to be sharing our journey and inspiration from South Africa. We're going to start by hearing from our middle son, Ellie, first. Before we start, uh, um, we, I just want to set the scene for you guys. And yes. um, I don't know who of you have been to Cape Town. It's a really beautiful city. We can actually, the windows open, we can hear the sea uh, beyond us, and uh, we can hear the seagulls chirping. But in about five minutes, you will hear, well, hopefully you won't hear it, but a generator will start because South Africa are having rolling blackouts. We've had for the last six months, maybe even a year, almost everyday blackouts where the country's grown at such a rate that they haven't kept up with the, uh, with the maintenance of the power plants and built enough power plants so that actually we have enough power for the people in South Africa. And uh, most people have backup power and we've tried to arrange things. Uh, our laptop is plugged into a, uh, into a battery backup generator is about to kick in and I'll close the window and there will be no more seagulls and you won't hear the sea anymore. Well, we certainly won't. <laughs> but just setting the stage for you guys, um, as beautiful as Cape Town is, we have our fair share of problems. Um, but uh, happy to be here. And Ilana did say it was okay. So I actually can't believe we're both wearing black. Yeah, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> I was like, what am I going to wear? And just out this way. Um, okay, let's move over to Ellie and please um, write us messages. We want to hear from the audience. We want to know what's on your mind. We want to know what you're thinking. Join us live on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, Casey, can we go to the first video, Ellie's video, sharing his experience? We actually wanted to cross live to him from uh, UCT, the University of Cape Town, but we weren't sure that we were going to have enough signal so we thought um, we would actually pre-record Hello, it. everyone. Even now Thank you, Shannon, oh, for yeah. giving me the opportunity to share my experience and thoughts on autism. I'm Ellie Gershlevitz, and my older brother, David, has autism. I decided to study medicine as I want to specialize in the autism field. Autism is a relatively new disorder, and not many doctors are involved in research and treatment. Growing up with my brothers, I feel that I have a unique and deep understanding of autism, which will help me create a significant impact in the field and really improve the lives of many other families. Growing up with David as my older brother, I always used to say that when we go out with him to the shops, it would be like walking next to a ticking time bomb. I can remember when going to the shopping center we would shop as usual and David's anxiety would build. Every time that we would go shopping, it would feel like walking next to a ticking time bomb. And when the time ran out, it would set off the bomb and this was never a pretty sight. To see David shriek and scream and hit himself, all I wanted to do was to hide behind my mom and hope that nobody that knew me could see me. Now that I'm older, and I realized that as much as I used to hide behind my mom, my mom had nobody to hide behind and she had to deal with the stares and burning glares and utter disbelief that we've had from other people 
looking at David have a meltdown or tantrum in the shops. It has really always angered me how people didn't have the decency to look away and save us from the embarrassment. But unfortunately, society can be insensitive and cruel. Honestly, being David's brother is harder than people would ever imagine. I'm constantly surprised and disappointed by the lack of understanding and the skewed perception of what autism really is. The media portrays individuals with autism to have exceptional skills and capabilities. Shows like The Good Doctor create an incorrect perception that most autistic individuals have exceptional capabilities, when in fact this is definitely not the case. TV shows tend to couple savant syndrome with autism, which misrepresents the true depiction of autism. These misconceptions of autism is preventing medical research that is very much needed to come up with treatments in order to alleviate the symptoms of autism. In my opinion, the root cause of the problem lies with the very definition of autism in the DSM-5. The time has come for autism to be redefined. The DSM-5 has lumped severe autism and Asperger's together. This has resulted in healthcare professionals not being able to get a proper understanding of a population that varies so greatly in its presentation. Without a clear distinction of various parts of the spectrum, we are comparing apples and oranges. It has become more urgent than ever to call for a split of the spectrum. Children with autism don't choose to be non-speaking. There are physical, medical underlying causes preventing them from expressing themselves. I read many books about autism to educate myself on treatment and to gain further understandings about the intricacies of this disease. My favorite book is by Dr. Brian Jepson, who is the author of Changing the Course of Autism. He explains the medical complexities of autism when he says that autism is merely one symptom of an underlying disease process that affects the immunological system, the gastrointestinal system, the toxicological system, as well as the neurological system. This definition of autism is applicable no matter where on the spectrum an individual has been classified. Based on current research, we can now see that autism is not a psychiatric condition requiring psychiatric medication. Autism is a very debilitating illness. 40% of children with autism are nonverbal. Why would any parent sit back and accept this? Autism is an epigenetic disorder that is developed due to the expression of vulnerable genetics triggered by environmental factors such as toxins, food, infection, and so on. If David could communicate beyond basic needs and those things he loves the most, I believe that he'd tell us that for him, autism is not a superpower. I feel his anxiety and frustration when he can't make himself understood. I see how he picks his skin until he bleeds as a result of his uncertainty about what's happening next. I sense the fear and confusion in his eyes when he's about to have a seizure and can't tell us. I'm aware of and appreciate the things that I could do easily and David is unable to do. He's taught me to be responsible and not take anything for granted. I still hold on to the hope that David will continue to recover from autism. I always used to listen in on to my parents who are consulting top professionals in the autism field to find a way to repair the damage that autism has done. They never stop looking for new treatments to solve his autism, even though David is 20 years old. This definitely prompted me to study medicine. When I was younger, David's seizures were always a shock. It felt like when you walk into a room and someone is hiding behind the door shouts boo. I remember an incident at my grandma's house where I actually thought that he died from the seizure. This encouraged me to take a first aid course and also this sparked my interest in medicine. Being in a situation where I felt helpless encouraged me to equip myself with the necessary skills to manage David's seizures, and this eventually led me on to joining an ambulance cadet program. When I was in high school, 
friends and other students would joke about autism or pass comments on autism that really upset me. They never understood severe autism, which upset me deeply, and it felt as if the challenges that my family and I had experienced were invalidated. To all the siblings out there, just know that you're not alone and that there are many other siblings just like you. Don't ever give up hope because there are many ways to help autistic children lead better lives. Try to help your parents in any small way you can. They are having a hard time dealing with autism. My way of dealing with, with autism was to do well at school. I didn't want my parents to endure any more suffering. The behavior of your sibling is not always in their control. Remember this in moments when you are faced with their challenges. My message to all siblings is to get involved, read books on autism, learn about the treatments and advocate for there to be more medical research to understand and treat autism. Thank you everyone for your time. So I want to say, after listening to Ellie there, um, I actually haven't heard that clip until now. And I'm thinking to myself, we're so privileged to have a, a child like Ellie. Um, he is mature beyond his years. You know, he's only 18 years old, but I would say he's got the maturity of a 40 or 50 year old. The amount of life experience that he's had and been through um, has really molded him. And, um, you know, in a way, I think it's a little bit unfair because we have uh, put this huge responsibility on Ellie because you know, he's younger than uh, than David, but yet it's almost like he's his older brother and he's responsible and takes care of him. And he knows that one day when Elon and I'm not here, he's going to have to take care of, of, of David. And I think that, um, you know, we're going to tell you a lot about a, a, a lot about our circumstances and, and our journey. But I, I think we're very, very privileged just listening to him to have such a mature, caring, you know, and he's he's never lost his cool with David ever. I can't think of a, a I mean, maybe in all these years, I, I ser seriously can't think of a, a situation where he's actually um, lost his cool with David. He's so patient, he's so kind, he's so caring, and he's very protective. And, um, you know, I think because he's been born into it and grown up with this situation, he doesn't look and say, okay, I've missed out on so much. Look what my friends are doing. He's never ever once said, oh, I, I could have done this. Or I could have done that. And uh, why did this happen to me? Maybe us as parents have thought that, but certainly not Ellie. He's just been okay with it. It's unbelievable. So I think we're very lucky to, what do you think? We're very yeah. lucky to have somebody like him. And um, yeah, we'll tell you a bit more about him. You've made me tear up and <laughs> choke up because I feel the same. We have been very fortunate to have Ellie. Um, he's really just been such a pleasure and he's never wanted to give us any kind of hard time because he knows that we've already had such a hard time um, with David. But now, Mark, remember when David, our oldest son, who's now 20, he was diagnosed 18 years ago with autism. And Mark, I remember you used to say... You know, Remember thought, what you used to say. I thought it was like a, a nightmare um, that hopefully I would wake up from. But uh, when I woke up every morning, autism was very much present in our life. And it's just it was a nightmare that I couldn't escape from. Uh, looking back, um, when we were in crisis, we initially received uh, David's diagnosis. And if I fast forward 18 years, I don't think we actually could have done more. No, we uh, couldn't have. We I did think, a lot. I mean, we, we, we did it absolutely everything we could. I don't think we rested. Um, part of that was healing, but part of it was just we were surviving. And uh, it's consumed us. In the beginning, when we were looking for help, we consulted with speech therapists and OTs. Um, we were also in touch with parents overseas. And I think this was uh, a key to our whole journey where we started. We met a lady by the name of Judy Chinnitz. Um Some of you may know her. Um, uh, her child, Alex, is actually a little bit older than David. And so she was in this fight already before we got onto it. And Judy was so smart. She was um, highly intelligent. She told us um, all the right things in the beginning, where we should seek help. And uh, she actually convinced me to fly to America and attend 
a, a DAN conference. I think that was Autism One. Before Autism One, there was something called DAN, Defeat Autism Now. And this is where uh, everybody, uh, all the people who are interested in autism, doctors and parents, all kinds of clinicians came. And I remember going to uh, my first DAN conference and being absolutely blown away. Uh, I told, I, I'm not sure if people from around the world, how many people from around the world are listening to this, but even if you're in America and you, let's say on the East Coast and it means flying to the West Coast, I highly recommend going to one of these conferences because, you know, when you arrive at the conference, there are thousands of parents in the same position as you. You know, when you're alone at home and you're dealing with your autism, you think that you're alone and uh, there are not so many people that this is happening to that, you know, this is like one in a million and, um, and now you've got this big problem that you have to deal with on your own. But when I was there and I looked to my left and right, I saw so many other people in the exact same position as me and we were just chatting while well, I was just chatting to other parents, I realized that I wasn't alone and that was very comforting. I felt supported. And I started to establish networks, and I uh, met doctors. Uh, I was totally inspired. I remember calling Ilana uh, um, excitedly, look, I met this person, I met that person, and I told her about all the things that we, um, that we could possibly be doing. Uh, when I returned to South Africa, we were extremely energized. I started reading books, started getting literature, started like, just getting better equipped to deal with uh, this journey. And I came across a book by, I don't know if it was you or me, maybe you gave it to me, but... I think uh, I did. I think I did. Um, by Dr. Jacqueline, yeah. uh, Jacqueline McCandless. She's no longer with us, but at the time... She, she was amazing. She was incredible. I mean, she had a granddaughter with autism. She was a psychiatrist, and she was looking for answers. And she wasn't scared. She was fearless. Uh, I remember her nature. We were a little bit scared of her. Yeah, I, I was definitely scared of her. Her nature was very, <laughs> I don't know how you put it, but... Um, she was scary. She was scary. And she told us to put him on a diet, remember? And, and she wasn't... No, she, she, wasn't was kid, she wasn't kidding She around. wasn't joking. <laughs> but, but before I tell you a bit about her, I read her book. And I couldn't believe when I was reading this book, I would say about 90% of the things that I... It was called Children with Starving Brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ninety percent of the stuff in her book were describing David to a T. I could not believe it. I read it over and over, and it, it, it was just too much of a coincidence. You know, this is this can't be. What she was describing was my was my child. We had to get hold of her. Nilana and I are very tenacious people. We, when we decide we're getting hold of something or we're doing something, we do it. I don't take no for an answer. And then we decided, okay, we've got to speak to this lady. She's going to help us. And I remember um, uh, trying to contact her in the beginning, but we couldn't, it didn't get much of a response. I can't remember if she responded or didn't. But to get her to be able to be a patient and to consult her. What we her, actually did was we packed a box of curious from South Africa. We put the big five. If you <coughs> ever want to come to South Africa, we've got elephants. We've got uh, lions. You can come on safari. But remember, we put all the little curios in a box with a big picture of David. And we wrote her card begging her to help us with David. And... Uh, um, we're thankful that she actually did. She responded. She said that she would help us. And we had our first consultation, and it was wonderful. I think that first consultation, we were mainly just giving her all the facts, facts yeah. just describing our child. And then we had to do all the lab tests. And so, you know, what we did is part of it was medical. David was a really sick child, um, so we had to medically get him better. And part of it was also uh, the therapy that we had to do from a behavior point of view and uh, educational point of view. But the lab tests that she ordered were onerous. You know, we were living in South Africa, felt like a million miles away, and we had to get uh, blood, stool, and urine to the United States. Some had to be refrigerated, some had to be uh, at room temperature, some had to be frozen. And, um, you know, it was... Uh, how did we? How were we meant to do this? And for me, the most daunting uh, part was is pricking David and getting blood from him. I didn't want to traumatize him. I was so worried about uh, making him feel bad. But we knew we had to do it. You know, since then we've done so many blood tests, and now it's nothing. David just puts out his arm, and it's nothing for him to take a blood test. But at the time, I think we were just as traumatized as David. And 
uh, David screamed, he cried. And I, I remember racing this, uh, this blood to the laboratory. Uh, we had prearranged everything to spin it in a centrifuge. I think it was to separate the, the, the blood from the, the red blood cells from the plasma. And then taking the blood, the stool in the urine, stool in the urine to uh, FedEx. And we had prearranged with FedEx and we had got all the permits, we had signed everything. Literally chartering a plane, which was one of FedEx's planes, we had pre, pre-booked it. <laughs> And everything had to get to the USA. Somewhere on the West Coast, somewhere on the East Coast, had to get there by a certain amount of time so that the samples wouldn't be spoiled. <coughs> um, and, and anyway, so we were thankful that everything arrived on time. And, um, and I remember receiving... Sorry, I've just had a flu. Do you want to just carry on with the story? Okay, that? yeah. So we got all the labs off to America... And Dr. McCandless sent us a report and she said, "Good, l- this is what's wrong with your son. David had viral infections, he had bacterial infections, <coughs> fungal infections, inflammation, immune issues. And at the end of her report, she said, you know, good luck with the healing of your child. And this was so inspirational. And, and really, this is just how we got started on the biomedical side. And it was so very special for us to share that story with, you know, the listeners today, because all the labs for biomedical testing are in America. The doctors are in, really in South Africa. So we just had to make a plan being in another country. And by the way, it, uh, for people listening, please message us, ask us questions. Remember, we love, we love on Facebook, we love on Twitter. So... Um, we're, we're actually nine hours ahead of PST. So, uh, no, it's, it's, it's 10.30 a.m. in the morning for <coughs> us. Um, and so, Mark, you know, on the education side... So that's so we really... tried everything possible with David. Like yeah. Whatever we could to support him. You know, we consulted with the best OTs that we could, speech therapists. Um, and we actually got a little room at our uh, synagogue, and we're Jewish, and um, we were looking for a place to do this. And so what we did is we got a special needs teacher... <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm bad. I just had the flu. You'll have to carry okay. on. <coughs> sorry, and excuse so me. We, um, we got a little room at a synagogue, you know, where we employed a special needs teacher for David, and we had OT and speed therapy coming in. And all we wanted, really, honestly, was to drop him, uh, to drop David off at a normal play school, just like every other parent. And... Um, we actually landed up convincing a small play school to take him and accept him as a student. It was a nightmare as um, he really didn't have prerequisite skills uh, for school to cope. And, you know, we felt he needed to go to school, but he wasn't coping. It was at this point where we then finally realized that it wasn't working out for him at school and we started to homeschool him. But his progress was really, really slow. And we never stopped searching for something more. And we found this girl, Tracy. She'd worked at another school for autism. She had experience working with autistic kids. So we employed her and we made a school and it was called Little Stars. We bought a house and we got a few more kids and we thought Tracy was gonna sort out all our problems. Tracy didn't have a lot of formal training dealing with autistic kids. Um, you know, she had training from the school she worked at. She, was, uh, she made up her own curriculum based on what she felt was right. And we made little progress, but not the best of progress. And I think just to take a moment there to say to parents that, you know, if something is not working, you've really got to dig deep and be honest with yourself that this is not working. And I did, um, you, you know, say that, like, whatever we're doing right now is not working and we need to look for something else. We kept on um, recalculating. And I think that's a very, very important point when you're on this autism journey and if one intervention is not working, you know, try something else. Don't stick with it because you're in a comfortable space. You really do have to move on to the next thing. And we did, you know, and... Um, one night, I went to Martin and I said, these conferences that we've been to in America are just so amazing and we should really bring it to South Africa. And at the time, we were consulting with one of the best autism doctors in the world. His name was Dr. Jeff Bradstreet. He was absolutely um, a legend. He was the reason many, many children um, 
found their healing. Um, he was the most incredible doctor. Sadly, he passed away many years ago. And Dr. Bradstreet Martin had actually met one of the, the Dan conference and, you know, he'd been David's doctor and the biomedical, we were doing really, really well for David. But as you guys can hear, as our story goes, we weren't doing really well on the education side. Um, and then one night I went to Martin and I said, remember, I'm going to make a conference. We're going to uh, bring Dr. Brecht Street to South Africa and I'm going to call it Challenging Children. Um, and then, you know, remember what Dr. Brecht Street told us. So, yeah, he actually wanted to convince us to bring uh, Doreen Grandpache. We'd never heard of, I think maybe we'd heard of Doreen before. Well, he said, <laughs> I'll come to South Africa, but I want to bring Dr. Doreen Grandpache with me. And we were like, who's she? I think, <laughs> okay. I think one, of the, yeah, one of the Dan conferences that I'd been to, I think she was uh, one of the guest speakers there. And so I'd had, probably had heard her name, but... We weren't convinced, you know, it was expensive to bring uh, uh, Brad Street to South Africa and now to pay another plane ticket. But he said, no, you have to get this lady here. Please bring her with. And so we actually decided to do it. And it was obviously the best decision of our lives. Um, you know, a few months later, uh, before we knew it, Jeff and Doreen arrived and we had the most wonderful conference in South Africa. And... Uh, we were privileged to get to know Doreen. You know, this was a, a rare opportunity. They, uh, they were in South Africa. There weren't all the um, uh, distractions in America. So we really bonded with her. We went out for dinners and we got to know her really well. And she got to know our family well. And it actually occurred to me after chatting to her for so long, how much time we had been wasting with David's education. Um, you know, we thought we wanted to put him in a place school to make him uh, as normal as we possibly could. I think most parents make that mistake. Um, you want a normal life. You want to hold on to what you think is normal or um, going to be the best for you and your family. Just put him in a normal school and then everything else will be okay. Um, but, you know, he wasn't coping in a normal school and it wasn't good for him. He wasn't really learning from his natural environment. And so we really had to, um, we had to do something. And... Um, you know, we established our own little school. Uh, it was called Little Stars at the time. It's now called the Star Academy, but it was called Little Stars. And we, um, you know, we, we employed a, a teacher called Tracy. Tracy was at another autism school. She didn't have a lot of official training. Mm. She wasn't like uh, uh, an OTSB therapist or a, a, a BCBA. She just had practical training where she was... Um, uh, uh, working at another school and, and, and got on the job training. And then as things were going, um, we thought we were doing well. She was, she made up her own curriculum. She, uh, she, she used a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And, um, and I think that, you know, we, uh, you, you know, we, uh, sorry, I may have missed part of what, what you were talking about at the beginning, but it didn't gel with us. We really didn't uh, like what we were seeing, especially after hearing everything that Doreen was telling us. So halfway during Doreen's presentation at the conference, I decided um, I've had enough. I walked out of the conference. I called Tracy aside and I said, you know, we have to actually, we can't carry on like this anymore. We have to change. We have to do what Doreen is telling us. And about two weeks later, Tracy actually left. She decided this wasn't for her. And before we knew it, Doreen had flown somebody to South Africa. We were up and running, and it was fantastic. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Doreen, I think before I move on to um, who Doreen sent to South Africa, um, do you want to tell them a little bit about Doreen? Yeah. Um, I don't think we could ever be grateful enough for what Doreen has done for us. Um, we were really lost. We were, um, the, um, Ilana cried every single day. Um, she was so low. We were miserable. Um, we, we were deep and dark and Doreen gave us light and hope. And you know, a lot of people promise us things or generally in life, they promise to do things. But when Doreen made that promise to us, she followed through with the promise. Everything that she said she would do, she did. And we will forever be grateful. Here in South Africa, a million miles away, 
Um, did we think that somebody could help us in the way that she did? And as a result, she's had the benefit and the, and the merit of all the people that we've been able to help in South Africa and around the world. She gets part of that merit because she really empowered us. She gave us the best people and she's a, 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 an angel, an absolute angel. And we always phone her. Um, there will always be things, issues that come up over all these years. Uh, we'll be panicked, something happened, we'll phone Doreen, and she just has a way of cutting right down to the, the bottom line and, and finding a solution for everything. She calms us, she's always there, she's always got our back, and, um, you know, never mind how great she is, I think everybody knows from a clinical point of view how amazing she is and that she's this uh, top, in the top of her field, but as a human being, um, she's just the most wonderful person. She's always been there for us. Doreen, if you're listening, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Yes, um, Doreen is an absolute legend. She has been absolutely amazing to, to South Africa and to the Star Academy. If it wasn't for her input, uh, we would never be able to have helped so many children uh, for more than a decade. Anyway, so... After Doreen came to the Challenging Children Conference, she said, I'm going to send one of my top clinicians to South Africa. And this is when uh, maybe some of your listeners have met Sue Cho before, um, because I know that Shannon has interviewed her and Sue came to South Africa. And the she's only... an ABA ninja. <laughs> yeah, she's an ABA ninja. For Sue, if she's listening, she's definitely an ABA ninja. No one can do training like Sue in ABA. And... Um, the only way I can probably describe Sue's arrival on first day of ABA training in South Africa is really just to conjure a desert scene. I mean, before Sue, before Doreen, we were lost in the desert, dragging our feet on the hot sand. We were bent over from exhaustion and heat. We had no compass, no idea where we were going as the strong rays of the sun blinded our sight. One sandy hilltop blended into another, Near death, we lay helpless on the sand, honestly suffering from heat stroke. The vultures were circling, waiting for us to drop to the ground. Um, when Sue arrived, it was like this big black chopper that just appeared from the sky with an American flag <laughs> Bla like emblazoned on the side. Down a rope came Sue the ninja, ninja Sue, okay? the American soldier. Sue would rescue us from the desert storm and provide the oasis we needed to end our wanderings. And this is precisely how I felt sitting through training on the first day um, you know, of Sue's arrival. Now, Martin, how do you tackle a diagnosis of autism? We've spoken about this before and you know, we said we want to share this with the parents. So I'm glad you used the word tackle because um... You do need to plan and strategize your next move. Um, you know, there are financial considerations, there's practical considerations and time pressure. Um, there are different stages of tackling the diagnosis. You know, there's the initial uh, phase where you're dealing with shock and uncertainty and fear. I think that the best thing that you can do at this point is gather as much information as you possibly can. I think if you can empower yourself with as much information, um, you'll make yourself strong. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've experienced over the years is where parents think that the service provider, be it the ABA team or the medical doctor or other therapists, are going to have all the answers and are going to sort out all your problems. It became very clear to me that we as parents must take charge and be incredibly involved in every aspect of the child's treatment program. You know, uh, you can be the best doctor, best education program in the world, but if you as a parent are not continuously involved, I think your chances of success are dramatically low. No one knows your child better than you. Um, I don't know what you think. Yeah. When I cast my mind back to the early days of David's autism, I remember, I remember feeling heartbroken and numb. Um, I really went into a period of mourning. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't wear new clothes. I wanted to punish myself. I only realized this many years later. And Mark, you know, you say that a parent must do the research, but they're, not, they're tired, they're not sleeping, they're physically drained, they're emotionally drained. How are they going to do this research? 
if I remember my experience, the feelings and emotions that uh, come to mind are overwhelming and um, debilitating. I kept on asking the question, why me? I'm sure everybody or a lot of us ask that question, why me? It's such a rare condition. Could this be happening to me? You know, why? Uh, if you're in a state of mind, um, you know, in that state of mind, it's very difficult to do anything about your situation. I uh, must confess that it did take me some time to fight off these feelings. And even though I started to become very proactive, there would be many, many times where these feelings would creep in and I would need to block these feelings out actively and consciously. You must put these scary feelings in a box. That's what I would recommend. If you put them in a box, lock them away and just move forward as fast as you can. The immediate question is why should I have to put them in a box in the first place? Why can't I just love my child for who he is? Why can't I just enjoy all the things that other parents enjoy raising with their child? This was even more significant for me as David was our first child and I felt very deprived of all the normal things that parents get to do. We actually had a next door neighbor whose child was born on the very same day as David. And it was very difficult to simply ignore the neighbor's child's development. I couldn't help noticing the small things other parents take for granted that we felt we were robbed of. My advice would be to find a medical treatment and therapy and focus all your energy on achieving success and results. By being active and throwing yourself into a formidable project like this, I think it will help you to forget about everything you feel deprived of and help you to win this battle. I'd like to give you an example of that perhaps you can relate to. If you're sitting on a bicycle and you're stationary and someone gives you a little nudge or somebody tries to push you over, you'll fall over easily. But if you're riding your bike and you have a bit of momentum and someone gives you a little nudge, you'll hardly feel it, feel it because you know you're going, you've got speed, you've got direction. If anything, you know, you'll have a little wobble, but you'll carry on riding in the same direction. And that's what I mean by acting. You need to move. You need to act. You must have set goals and you must plan to achieve that goal. There will be many ups and downs, but if you stay focused on the bigger picture, you will get through these challenging times. I think I'm mainly talking to parents that have had a new diagnosis and are just starting on this journey, but even for other parents who have been a little bit on this journey, a little bit on the road, I really think that this is like really practical advice. I'm very practical as a human being, and that's why I'm going on this direction because I feel that uh, a lot of the time people don't get told what to do or, or don't know what to do. And uh, for me, one of the most important things, another crucial point, is that hope is possibly one of the most important ingredients for success. You need to create situations to keep your hope alive. And I just want to repeat that because it sounds contrived. It sounds like, um, you know, watch it, but I'm telling you, you need to create situations you need to create situations where you keep hope alive. If one treatment doesn't work, then another treatment may work. If one dosage of a medication doesn't achieve results, try another dose, a higher dose of that same medication. Hope will foster a positive mental attitude, which is essential to achieving your goals. It will give you the confidence and energy you need to ride your bike faster and get back on when you fall off. When I look back on my, my journey, many of the hopes and dreams I had for David were maybe exaggerated or, dare I say, false hopes. But at the time, they were very real to me, and it kept my fire burning. And you know, like, as I'm saying these words, I'm thinking to myself, um, false hope, creating false hope. But I, I think that just surviving from day to day is the most important thing at certain parts of their journey. And then hopefully those days can become weeks and months. But, you know, very early on in my journey, I was made aware of the divorce rate of parents raising children with autism. And I took a conscious decision that I would not become one of those statistics. Inevitably, parents will deal with hardship differently. And in my case, Ilana was dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges. And my role was to try and earn as much money as I could to pay for everything that David needed. I decided that the best thing that I could do was to support Ilana as much as I possibly could. 
even when I disagreed with her. <laughs> and some of the decisions relating to autism that she had taken at the time. Um, uh, you know, even when she was right, I still, I still agree. Even when she was wrong, I still agreed with her. You know, just, I just bury my pride sometimes <laughs> and just agree with what she was saying. I thought we had to be united in this epic battle. You know, you're fighting autism every day, every hour, every minute. There's no room or space to fight each other. We chose to fight autism. <laughs> when you're not sleeping, when your child won't eat, and when your whole world falls to pieces, it can be difficult to remain reasonable and sane. Ilana and I both like the phrase, choose your heart. <coughs> Excuse me. Please carry on. Please okay. tell them. I can't. I can't. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to keep it together. You know, it's hard to be a parent to the other siblings. It's hard to be a good wife or husband. It's hard to go out in public, choose your heart. Um, you know, I think we've got like only 10 minutes left. So what I want to do is I, I want to... I can't believe it. You're joking. <laughs> no way. So what I want to do is we've got pictures and videos and we, we, we know it. Can I ask it. you something? Please share a day in David's life. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay. okay, so I want to share a day in David's life. So um, just to let everybody know, David was enrolled in ABA for his whole life. He's 20 years old, and I think he just graduated off ABA about a year ago. And I think this is the mistake that parents make, you know, they feel they're not getting the results that they want, and then um, they stop ABA. But ABA is first-line treatment. We know that it's regarded a medical necessity, and really, David would never have the level of functionality and independence that he has currently if um, he didn't receive all those years of ABA. So um, maybe we can just uh, ask the producer to share a video of uh, David having some behavior. I'd like to show this because this is what, you know, we went through in David's teenage years. David uh, would have a lot of aggressive behavior. And maybe we can just quickly see that clip because I want to show you what David looked like. And then I'm going to tell you about a day in David's life today. Casey, can we get that clip? I'm filming you, I'm going to... Thanks, Casey. So, you know, that's what David looked, out, looked like in his teenage years. Um, Casey, can we get the video of David in the kitchen uh, baking the rolls? You know, um, now David works in a kitchen and um, we're going to see what his day looks like there. Can we get that video clip just to show how he's making the bread and rolling the dough? Nice. And then, well done, Dave. Okay, next one. You're actually getting better. Shame you care. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well done. Okay, so thank you so much for showing that clip. And that was ABA, you know. Um, we weren't going to achieve that level of independence and functionality for David if he didn't have all those years of ABA. So what does a day in David's life look like? We found him the most wonderful caregiver. Um, while I'm speaking, Casey, can you put uh, the pictures on of David? You can maybe flash through them. There's one of David at the sea, David standing next to a car. This is his caregiver. You know, when David turned 18, we couldn't buy him a car, but... Um, we bought his caregiver and David a car together because his caregiver drives him around. He'll pick him up in the morning. David can independently dress himself and feed himself. Um, he will go with his uh, caregiver to the, sh to the shops. They will buy ingredients for the day. Um, David then works in a kitchen with a chef and they plan the menu for the week. David can peel vegetables and chop vegetables, um, and they make soups and stews and pizzas. 
And, you know, we feed homeless people and we feed orphans from the food that David makes. And the smile on David's face when we eat his food or when he sees um, somebody eat his food is really just precious. And I think we've managed to make such a meaningful life with David. Casey, can we see some pictures of David and his caregiver? Okay, I think we, we're having some problems with those pictures, but while Casey's getting those pictures, you know, um, I am able to have, that's our family, by the way, that um, a couple of years ago, and I'm gonna, you know, just before we end, I will be sharing my younger son's journey with autism as well with you. And I did share our journey in my book, Saving My Sons, a journey with autism. If you would like any inspiration, here's the book. And um, I'm gonna talk just now about how we recovered my younger son. If we can move to the next picture, I'm hoping to see David with his caregiver. Um, no, but David's life um, is very, he has a very happy life, very productive. He's up early in the morning. Um, his day starts at about 8.30 where he goes with uh, his uh, caregiver, uh, his name is Kaya. They go shopping, they do shopping for the ingredients for the day. And there's a plan, Ilana plans the menu with this chef every Sunday. They plan the menu for the week and then they decide, okay, what day they're going to shop for what ingredient. And, and David's really great. So, yeah, a normal recipe would be 10 steps. For David, it's 50 steps. And, um, you know, it's, you know, I think it, his whole life has got meaning now. Absolutely. Okay. And there um, we have on the screen actually my younger son, Aaron, when he was five years old. And in a couple of minutes left, we're going to quickly share his recovery story. So David is our first son. He's now 20 years old. He's profoundly autistic, but because of all the biomedical intervention and the ABA he received for so many years, he has a very good level of functionality and independence, and I hope that that inspires you. My second son, Eli, um, he shared his thoughts on autism, and he's studying medicine at UCT. And then years later, I was very brave. I had, and we had another child, and uh, my youngest, Erin, at 17 months, I'll, I'll never forget phoning Doreen and, you know, telling her how concerned we were because we saw the red flags to autism unfold in front of us in a couple of days. Um, with Erin, we were absolutely gutted in the beginning to see those symptoms of autism. It, we had to dig really, really deep uh, to find the courage to fight for him, but we did. And Aaron had the best outcome. You know, uh, we put him into seven hours a day of ABA at the age of 17 months. Um, it was a slog. We were in so much trouble. At the time that Aaron started his ABA program, you know, my oldest David was 10. And so we'd already watched the movie of autism. And when you watch a movie like that, and you know what's going to happen it can be very very frightening because david was struggling to speak at that point and now our youngest aaron um, he wasn't imitating he was running in circles he lost his eye contact wasn't responding to his name um, and we put him into seven hours a day of aba um, we really had to pay attention to detail um, every every target we we made sure i'd like you to jump yeah. in yeah i've got to because I witness this from the outside, and it's so important that people understand. I wish the whole world was listening now. I know people are sleeping in the middle of the night there, but some people need to hear this. If you think you're going to put your child in an ABA program, and then everything's going to be okay, and somebody else is going to take care of your child and make them successful, that isn't going to happen. You as a parent, well, we as a parent, we're very involved in Ilana. I witnessed Ilana. Why I'm talking so fast? Because I know we're running out of time. But Ilana threw herself into that program. She made sure she understood all the targets. She understood all the details of the program. And more, more importantly than that, she actually connected with the therapist and made sure that they were motivated. You know, as Ilana is an ABA provider here in South Africa, a large part of the program is, yeah, you need to be a good clinician. You need to understand. But you need to have a relationship with the parent and a relationship with the child. That's crucial. You can be as clever as you want to be. But if you don't know what motivates that child, and, again, the connection with the parent has to be involved. So Ilana was involved. So when 
the team wasn't getting a target or they weren't making any progress progress. Ilana would jump in herself. She'd like roll up her, roll up her sleeves, jump in there and do all the work. And I think you, I must admit, are a large part of the reason why we were successful. I mean, there are the ingredients. Um, Ilana is very spiritual. There's a spiritual side. There's too much to talk about. There's a yeah, whole so lot of I'll, things. I'll just share the spiritual side. But if you finish telling them about Erin and who he is today, just well, quickly tell them Okay, so where, where is Erin today? So Erin is recovered from autism. We reversed his autism. He is indistinguishable from his peers. Um, he is in grade five. He is in mainstream school. And we got our boy back. And he is an absolute miracle. And my advice to parents is that you can do the biomedical and you can do the ABA but you must never forget the spiritual side. And I'll never forget um, when Erin was around two years old, my heart was broken. I was so sad. I was running two ABA programs, one for David, one for Erin. And I was, I was very afraid of what the future would hold. And a friend of mine gave me a very special prayer. And she said, say this prayer and light a candle and there's miracles around the number 40. So you meant to say this prayer for 40 days and 40 nights and light a candle because the act of lighting a candle just reminds us that um, there's miracles. And she said, turn off the light. And when you see that flame, you know that light can overpower darkness. And this was so meaningful to me. And I said the prayer every single day. And she also said to me, the candle must continue burning. It, it shouldn't go out. It's not a good sign. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I don't know how many years has it been now? Like nine years, going on 10 years. I say the prayer every day. I didn't just do it for um, 40 days. There's always a candle burning in my home. It uh, reminds me that miracles are possible. And... Um, to my side from miracle is that I take Erin to school every day. And I don't think a day goes past that I don't appreciate the miracle of Aaron and him talking. Um, by the way, that's David in the book. That's him on the cover. But Aaron is a miracle. Every word that comes out of his mouth, I don't take it for granted. I just love listening to him. I love hearing him talk. And it's like just honey dripping from his, from his mouth. Uh, yeah, and I just want to add, like with both our boys, you know, David was really not destined to speak, but we pushed words out of him. And Aaron, when we started, people will say he didn't have autism. People will say maybe he was more mildly affected. None of that. We were in serious trouble. You know, Aaron had a very serious apraxia, speech motor planning impediment. And I just want to quickly tell parents in America that if you can access a, a prompt trained speech therapist, that stands for prompts for restructuring oral muscular phonetic targets. And you can get that prompt trained SLP to work with your ABA team. That's going to be really a good way to address that speech motor planning element. And that really worked for my younger son, Aaron. We would um, have ABA as our base, but we incorporated different tools. And, you know, um, as we've said, we really did have the best outcome. And so I think we have one minute left and the time has come to thank Shannon Penrod um, for giving us this platform to share our story and for organizing the podcast-a-thon. Shannon, you have been a guiding light. You have provided invaluable information on autism treatment to thousands of families around the globe for so many years. Your podcast, Autism Live, is rated as the number one podcast and really, it kept me going through the darkest periods of my life. You, my hero, your book, Autism Parent to Parents, Sanity Saving Advice for Every Parent with a Child on the Spectrum, discusses all a parent of a child with autism needs to know. Um, your son, who at an early age was diagnosed with autism, is now successful as a college student studying screenwriting. Through your honest advice, you empower parents, um, your book leaves everyone inspired and hopeful and armed with the information that they need to decide on treatment options. Thank you very much again. Goodbye from Cape Town, South Africa.